Game of Thrones best and worst changes from the books. Now, you haven't read the books, right? I read the books twice before you picked one up, right? Relax. How many times? Twice? Twice through. Yeah. Okay. Well, you, then you're a nerd. Nerd too? So best and worst changes. Well, I mean, this is all over the internet. People complaining about the changes. Yeah, I'm very indifferent with a lot of the changes unless it's like dramatic. But some of the stuff, it's just logical to change or to have an adjustment. I, I'm not like a nitpicker like where it's like one little change. I'm not going to go crazy that like. Uh, I'm the same way. I mean, yeah. it's just, it is what it is. The books are the books. The show is the show. But they couldn't have included Renly's speech. Oh. You can't give a brother a peach. <laughs> you say he rides into battle on the back of a giant dire wolf. They say he can turn into a wolf himself when he wants. They say he can't be killed. Do you believe them? No, my lord. Anyone can be killed. I would say my second, this is probably my second favorite change from the books. Arya and Tywin, their conversations. These scenes are incredible between these two characters. It's just so great to see a young, great actress like Maisie Williams with the old veteran Charles Dance. To just, compete with him, to and keep just the up with him. And the characters, too. Like they're, both fan, they're both great, but like the characters they play are so great, too. They're very similar characters, in a way. Yeah, they are. Tywin even says, you know, you remind me of my daughter, but think- better. <laughs> and in my opinion, I think when Arya goes to Harrenhal in the books, it's kind of a mess. I would say even the Jack and Hagar storyline in season two is better than the books. It was such a great change to change it from her interactions with Roose Bolton to Tywin, because you have the conversation of where they're talking about their fathers. She tells Tywin, my father died from loyalty. Tywin asks her, what do you think about Rob Stark? Do you believe the rumors that he can't die? And she says, no, everybody can die. And she grills him. She's grilled cheese in him. And he's like, and I love the part when he tells her the story about King Harren. King Harren built a castle that can withstand a march from a million men, and then Aegon just came through with the dragons and burnt it all down. A million men could have marched on these walls, and a million men would have been repelled. But an attack from the air with dragon fire, Harren and all his sons roasted alive within these walls. And Arya's even spitting, like, hey, don't forget about the sisters, with Visenya and Rhaenys. And Tywin's like, oh, yeah, I'm sure I remembered that. I also think she's the only character in Game of Thrones who ever made Tywin Lannister laugh. Are most girls more interested in the pretty maidens from the songs? John Q, flowers in her hair. Most girls are idiots. <laughs> yeah, you kind of see, like, she kind of grown up in a way, because when we know Arya, she was still, like, the youngest daughter of Ned. She's still young, but... We see him talking like grown ups like that, like on their level, and then it makes sense how she would be able to be such a survivor going forward. You think she's the smartest Stark? She's probably the most resourceful. I never heard of before. But who are we? Hmm? We have no names, no family. Every one of us is poor and powerless. And yet together, we can overthrow an empire. Well, the Sparrows, like, in the books, they're great, too, but I, I, I never felt when I was reading it, when you're reading Cersei's chapters, you still, like, it's still Cersei to you. In the show, they make her out to be her own protagonist, where you're rooting for her in her own subplot, and it's just amazing writing. It's also the benefit of watching these characters on film rather than just seeing them from Cersei's perspective. Like you said, it's still a Cersei chapter. But these characters in the show, they almost take over the whole damn kingdom. And one thing about them is that they're so damn hateable that they made the fans root for Cersei. Yeah. That they made the High Sparrow, he's such a prick, he's so condescending, but he acts like he's so innocent. I like and that too, how they were able to take, I think this goes with it more than like a separate change, just Tommen being older. You're able to see him um, manipulate him. He's not a young boy where he's not sitting around playing with Sir Pounce, which maybe we could have got a couple more scenes of that. Right, <laughs> yeah, we need more Sir Pounce. <laughs> but, That's going to uh, be in the worst changes. <laughs> but the manipulation of the High Sparrow to Tommen, where you absolutely... There were points where I hated Tommen more than Joffrey, which is in- right. incredible. Right. People wanted Joffrey to come back and just kill these guys. Yeah, I'm like, where's Joffrey? I need Joffrey to come wipe these guys out. And like, I hated Tommen just because it's such a different way, you know? Yeah, the way they manipulated him to make him become so pious, to become the pious king. And to be fair, we don't know how it's going to end in the books, but I think what we have compared to the books, this yes. was a And a John- Jonathan Price too. Absolutely oh, incredible. Yeah, so good. The only other thing I remember him from is Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> He's Kira Knightley's dad. 
Don't you look lovely? Marriage agrees with you. Can we bring you anything to eat or drink? I wish we had some wine for you. It's a bit early in the day for us. Marjorie is another character that in the books you don't see the story from her perspective. There's rumors about how she's seductive. She's kind of a femme fatale character. But in the show, you see, she was only the only one to really rein in Joffrey. The way that she was able to manipulate Joffrey and then manipulate Tommen. This was one of my favorite characters in the show, and I was really sad when she was killed off. Yeah, you really sort of come, a, come into her own. You're not just seeing it through Cersei's eyes. Of course, you just think, oh, Cersei just hates her because she feels threatened by her. What she does in the show, but you don't see it from Marjorie's. You don't like, get to see what Marjorie's actually doing and planning. Like her talks with Olena. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, some of the best scenes. Olena, too, in the, yeah, in the show. I think you could really put both of them in there. They're just the way they, they're planning. They're, they're, based, they're playing the game, too. I mean, oh, everyone they're, and sees, they're two of the best players. You see Littlefinger, Varys, and uh, Tyrion, but they're playing the game just as much as anyone. They're setting their family up as well. Once Joffrey gets, well, first Renly, then Joffrey, and then Tommen. They make a lot of smart moves. Yeah. And I think some of the best scenes are is with Elena sparring with some of the major players. The first scene that she has with Varys, it's the only time where Varys isn't getting the last word in this conversation. She's She makes Varys bite his tongue. Same thing with Tywin. I don't care what people believe. And neither do you. As an authority on myself, I must disagree. Same thing with Littlefinger, and of course, she owns Cersei in every scene. We need each other. I wonder if you're the worst person I've ever met. At a certain age, it's hard to recall. But the truly vile do stand out through the years. And the scene with the sand snakes in season six, yeah. it's like, you look like an angry little boy. Shut up. Are we just changing this to uh, I think I think Elena was the better change. <laughs> you don't fight with honor. No. He did. I mean, the Bronn and Tyrion stuff made me really like Tyrion even more. I remember in the first season, I wasn't really sure how I felt about Tyrion. I'm new to the character, I'm new to the show, Lannisters aren't supposed to be... It sets you up where you're not supposed to root for the Lannisters, but his back and forth for Bronn, it just... Right off the bat, these two actors had great chemistry. And I think that's... In the books, he's kind of just disappeared after Tyrion is accused of Joffrey's murder. But in the show, they liked him so much that they paired him with Jaime. Even though that season is controversial for the Jaime and Bronn storyline, Bronn is still one of the best parts of the show. He's funny. He's a great swordsman. He's got a great voice. Brother, oh brother. Yeah, it kills that. Riff, it. One of my favorite scenes. It's the benefit of doing it on film where you get to explore this character more because he's not going to be a point of view character. You know, he's a sellsword. Yeah, I think it was his name Wilco Johnson who played Ellen Payne. Right. Unfortunately, he passed away so they couldn't have that aspect of Jaime training with Ellen Payne like he does in the books. It was this great idea idea to put Braun into that character right, and help yes. him get his left hand back. Because those those scenes are funny that he just kind of crackles at him. He doesn't want anyone to tell. Yeah, right. right. It's kind of funny to do a jab with Braun like it's like don't tell anyone. It's like, "Oh, well, you pay too good." Like Yeah, yeah, right. And there's an awesome scene in the books though cuz he kind of does disappear and that's something I don't like, but he names his wife's bastard son Tyrion right after Tyrion gets accused of all that and it just drives Cersei crazy and it's it's so funny. <laughs> He's such a troll. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And those actors hate each other in real life. Oh, yeah, I heard that. Does loyalty mean nothing to you? It means everything to me. And yet here you stand. And yet here I stand. I haven't seen a lot of people mention that Jorah is better in the show because I think he kind of goes under the radar. But for me, the way I read Jorah in the books, he was kind of this sulking, brooding, uncharismatic character. He's kind of perverted, too, the way he comes on to Daenerys. He's very charismatic in the show. He's charming. He's a great swordsman. He's one of the most complex characters, even from the stuff that we don't see, all the stuff with his wife, to where he ends up in the beginning of Game of Thrones. I think he's a much better character in the show. A lot of it comes down to, like, on screen, it just makes everything better. And I think that uh, Ian Glenn does a great job with the character as well. Much more handsome in the show. Like, you're actually like, oh, come on, Daenerys, <laughs> can let me have a shot. <laughs> I mean, yeah. In the, in the books, he's more described as he is, like, he takes on his sigil, the bear, big, hairy, brooding guy, balding. I think his chemistry with Daenerys is better on screen with Amelia Clark. When they castrated you, did they take the pillow with the stones? I've always wondered. Have you? Do you spend a lot of time wondering what's between my legs? I mean, we've talked about this on several occasions. The scenes between Littlefinger and Varys are just 
gripping. Probably the best written scenes, I would argue, in the entire show. Because you really get what Game of Thrones is about with these two characters, especially since they've changed Varys in the show. But the quips, the wittiness, uh, the intelligence, it's all on display when these two characters are in the same scene. And the actors who portray them, Aidan Gillen and Conleth Hill, incredible. Both Irish. They're both kind of perfect for the roles, if you think about it. Perfect casting. Yeah, their conversations, it just adds so much to their background where... You and it doesn't really give much away. It would very be in- subtle, it's very... It makes you it makes you think more. And you wouldn't see this in the books because it would be impossible, more so Varys than Littlefinger, to have a point of view chapter for these characters because it would spoil so many things. If you got a Littlefinger point of view chapter in book one, all those surprises from Feast for Crows or Storm of Swords would be ruined. So it's great that we get to see these characters interact. But you could see that there's a little rivalry in the books but it's on full display in the show. Do eunuchs have a phantom cock? Next time you think about naked girls, when you feel an itch. The genius of Game of Thrones is that they introduced a villain that was as hated and evil as Joffrey, and then he became one of the most iconic villains of all time. He dies, and in the same season they introduce a villain who's probably more hated and more iconic than Joffrey. In a matter of a year, he usurped Joffrey as the most hated villain on TV. I mean, Joffrey, you always got the sense, like, you know how, like, troubled and sick he was, but he would let other people do his things for him. He's more of a sociopath. Yes, but, like... Ramsay's a psychopath. Ramsay, he was in the dungeons just tormenting Theon. Re- oh, Reek, sorry. I'm Reek. It's just, it was, it was pretty brutal to watch, and... You don't get that in the books. It's hinted at. You see it. You, you get Theon, and uh, he's already Reek. He's yes. gray hair. He's, you get to see the, the transition into right. the Reek character. And it's brutal. Oh my god! And but the thing is, too, Ramsey, like he's still like a like he's still like a psychopath, piece of shit, bad guy in the books. But we get to see more of him in the show. I mean, it's kind of weird, like saying they get to see more of that stuff is good. But it, the way he does it, he's so much more clever. He's a better fighter in the books, and he, it adds more to the villain character. In uh, the books, he's just more of just, just a psychopath that loves to torture people. And he's not as major as he is in the show. By season no. six, he's the biggest villain. In yes, the show. he's still like a psychopath and all that. He's more ambitious. He's more. He has a plan. He's smarter. He's more clever. Yes, he's you a, know, he's playing his own game in, in a way. That's probably the biggest difference between him and Joffrey is that Ramsay knows what he's doing. Joffrey is a little whiny bitch. The, the other difference is that I know people who like Ramsay. There, there was a small section of Game of Thrones fans who actually enjoyed the character. He was almost like the Joker of Game of Thrones. Yeah. The difference with Ramsay is that he's actually killing and hurting people that we love. He added to the story rather than just having all this senseless, it made you hate him more. And that's, that's good when you want to watch like a show. You yeah. want someone to root for. Right. Root against. Yeah, well, hold on. <laughs> I always wanted some Valerian steel. Come with me, Arya. I'll take you to safety. Safety? Where the fuck's that? Her auntie Neary's dead. Her mother's dead. Her father's dead. Her brother's dead. Winterfell is a pile of rubble. There's no safety, you dumb bitch. You don't know that by now. You're the wrong one to watch over her. Brienne in the show is someone that had her ups and downs, I would say, throughout the series, but I think one of the strong points of season four and Brienne's arc post Jamie was the showdown with her and the Hound. It's similar to the books where after you talk about the post Jamie arc where she's given the sword and Jamie tasks her with finding the Stark girls. The showdown between her and the Hound, and first of all, the, the speech that the Hound gives to her about Arya that there's nowhere to hide, and then they just duke it out yeah, it was dirty it was grimy there was cheap shots there was you know it was like the, the old hound <laughs> grabbing the sword and oh my it was... oh that was such a great scene it was like those old cartoon scrummages when it's like the ball and everybody's fighting you know <laughs> what i'm talking about yeah and then it turns out that the hound comes back and he survives but you know you got to give brienne some credit she took down one of the best fighters in the show that's her because he's changed to the hound he sees a different man when you see him for like a scene <laughs> and then he goes back to grabbing the axe and <laughs> right yeah he changed for like those 20 minutes How many times have we seen him in the book? Twice, I think? The opening scene and, uh... And then Crasser's son. The way that they've handled them in the show, they've made them so mysterious, so evil, and I think the Night's King himself is the best villain that the show has ever done, and he's been in, like, three episodes. But they're so mysterious, and they're so evil, and, and you know that they're lurking behind the shadows, and they haven't fully exposed the threat yet, but I think in the show they've handled them better, because we've seen these, these momentary glimpses of the true power of the White Walkers. I agree that, like, when you see less of something, it adds to it more. 
but I think in the book it's it's too much it's less. Too, yes, it's <laughs> too less. You get you get like I said, you only seen him a handful of times in the show. But even the times, every time you see him, it's like a jaw dropping, oh my god moment. When the you scene see, with Sam. Yeah, every terrifying. every time they're on the screen, they absolutely just just waiting here on the edge of your seat. You want to see what's going on because you want to like, oh, we're finally seeing them. Let's see what they what they're doing. Can we like finally get some more? But they tease it just a little, tease it, tease it, tease it, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, like the, the mystery surrounding them. Right, and when that showdown happens, the song of ice and fire, dragons versus walkers, it's going to be that much better because we've been patient and we've waited. They're going to deliver because how can't they? My favorite episode that the show has ever done, Hard Home to Me. In the books, it's hinted at that there's this fight between the Night's Watch and the White Walkers, but in the show, we get to see it. And the moment when Jon Snow is fighting the White Walker, one of the four horsemen, and he picks up that Valyrian steel sword, he picks up Longclaw, and it clanks against the, the White Walker's spear. Chills. I just chills thinking about it right now. It's the best moment the show has ever delivered. It's incredible. Like I remember when I was watching it and he grabbed that. I'm like, no, no, what are you doing? I thought he was gonna die the whole time. I'm like, this is it. This is where John dies. And then when he survived, I'm like, he's never gonna die. And then he died like two episodes. <laughs> oh no, when he when he stops that blow, it's I was going, let's fuck you. Like, I was going crazy. <laughs> and then he comes, hits him right there. Cause the John, look on the White Walker's face too. Yeah, he was shocked. <laughs> just the whole the whole episode. Not even that. That's a great moment, but. The whole build up to everything. The we conflict got, between the watch and the wildlings, you know, come south of the wall. We need to fight these guys Tormin together. Beating the crap out of the Slaughter Bones and yeah, then right. vouching for John and everybody. The speech that John gives. The long night is coming. And the dead come with it. No clan can stop them. The free folk can't stop them. The night's watch can't stop them. And all the southern kings can't stop them. Only together. All of us. And even then, it may not be enough, but at least we'll give the fuckers a fight. Gets me hype every time I hear and it. Then it just gets dark and the snow comes and oh, it's cold. The and dogs are barking. What might be a better moment is when the Night's King finally reveals himself. When he walks on that dock and he's grilling Jon Snow and he slowly raises his hands and all those motherfuckers wake up. Chills thinking about it. it that's one of the most terrifying scenes in cinema history. And it's just this one small moment. No, There's no jump scares. There's no music playing. Everything's just quiet. Oh. All you hear is the footsteps of the Night's King. The two best moments at the show has ever done you can literally just put that on whenever you want and no matter how many times you watch it it's just always just as good and the look that Jon Snow and the Night's King share that they're staring at each other like it's gonna end with either one of us alive and hopefully the Night's King doesn't get the high ground oh, can't help yourself coming up with this list I think this was the first thing that immediately just jumped into my mind we had to talk about it just Dorne I'm not just saying like one part of Dorne one person I'm just saying Dorne in general the only good thing about Dorne is Oberyn it's like, like I said, I don't mind changes, but when you miss this, basically exclude a whole set of characters and a plot that would have added to the show. It just seems like a missed opportunity. The Ariane storyline is completely disregarded. The Dornish master plan. That's yeah. so, it gives Doran so much more depth and character development and adds to him so much. Few X is just a book show where, who's, who's Doran? Oh, remember that guy in the wheelchair who got stabbed? Oh, that guy sucked. In the books, they kind of build him up like, oh, he sucks too. He has no idea what he's doing. Then it's finally revealed that he has this grand master plan to support the Targaryens that he sends his oldest son Quentin to Marine to meet Daenerys and say let's form an alliance let's take the seven kingdoms together that's why I say the show should have been expanded to 20 episodes because Dorne could have been a, a show by itself well, they could all have the added, politicking they could have added another season like, and the Sand Snakes suck oh my god it's just, so annoying it's too much I mean we like all right, Oberyn's uh, Bastard Daughters okay that's cool and it is cool in the books um, but it's just Mr. It, Mark it just doesn't work I love to see the Sand Snakes their plot to get uh, Marcella crown her and then Arianne all the plotting all the scheming they're playing their own game in Dorne just to reveal the massive plan it just ah, gets me upset and Jamie and Braun and Dorn it became like a buddy cop movie oh, look at Jamie and Braun and Dorn you know they're they're sneaking around and then they're fighting the sand snakes 
Oh, for fuck's sake. Even the showrunners, like, the way they just got rid of him, too, was just like, we know we fucked up. Yeah, the so. way they killed Doran in uh, episode one of season six, or episode two. It's like, okay, we're, we're going to move on from this. I think just the worst part about it, too, is, like, how great Oberyn was in the show and Pedro Pascal. Like, when I pull my blade, your friend starts bleeding quite a lot, I'm afraid. So many veins in the wrist. That's one thing they got right. Yes, it was so great, and then they just kind of shit on his legacy, kind of. Like. Yeah. Oh, we don't we don't hurt little girls in Dorne. Um, oh, I hated that. And then Alaria Sand. What's the best way to avenge uh, Oberyn? Kill his family. <laughs> they love Marcella in the book. No, they want they want her to be the queen. That's their whole. That's their plan B. Their plan A is to marry their oldest son Quentin to Daenerys, but he's nowhere to be found. He's replaced with Tristane, who gets stabbed through the fucking eye. So great, great job, D and D. Oh, I'm gonna get pissed at them. Ariel Hota. Oh, I'm gonna everything. get pissed as this list goes on. You're a greedy bitch, you know that? This is a character that had great potential as a villain because in the books, he's one of those characters that he's very mysterious. Nobody knows where he's been for the entire series. And then he kind of just shows up and he kills Balon Greyjoy. And he does that in the books. He's probably in the show for an episode where he takes the throne and then he's like, let's go kill my niece and nephew. It's similar to Dorne where all the politicking, all the infighting for the Sea Stone chair, completely disregarded for one scene. There was like seven people fighting for the throne for the Sea Stone chair. I wish I had that, like, Victorian's such a great character, too, so they kind of combined him at Euron, but Euron isn't, doesn't look and seem like someone that you could took Euron and Victorian and put him together, created the super great joy. He's kind of just like... No, he kind of shows up, makes a couple of dick jokes, and he's like, I'm the king. In the books, there's, you know, there hasn't been a king smoot for hundreds of years. There's never been a queen. The dragon horn, that's one of the things that we think they're going to just disregard. Even in the books, we don't know if it works, but it would have been so cool if they introduced this earlier. That would have been a real threat it gives to Daenerys. A, yeah, it gives him a fighting chance. Now we just think, like, oh, it's another guy who's going to get smoked by the fucking dragons. He may win a battle or two in the sea, but who cares? Yeah, right. Who cares? Nobody cares about this character. It's They should have just left him. The House of the Undying change, it's the one change where I think it was handled very well in the show for the budget, for the time. You couldn't have done all that happened in the House of the Undying on TV, but I wish they would have done more. The visions that she experiences, Daenerys, they're so important to the future of the show. There's, there's so many things that happen in the House of the Undying that we could have went back and said, oh, that was a little bit of foreshadowing. And even things that haven't come yet. So, I think Quarth was... Quarth? Uh, Quarth? Quarth, Quarth, the greatest city that ever was. Yeah, uh, I think they were both kind of dull in both the show and the books. The House of the Undying is something that fans still look back to to make their theories for the books. And it's it's great because there's just so much there. It adds some death. You see you see a little bit of Rhaegar. You see a little bit of Rob. You see, you know. Yeah, she things, sees the Red Wedding. Things Daenerys has no business seeing being foreshadowed. She even sees a vision of her father telling everybody to burn down the Red Keep. She sees a vision of a blue flower that kind of indicates the true parentage of Jon Snow. In the show, they don't really hint at who Jon Snow's parents are, so this could have been a great moment of foreshadowing where people could have looked back on and said, oh, okay, that's what that meant. It's I mean, it's cool you get to see, like, Jason Momoa again as Cal Drogo, but... Yeah, that was cool. In the show in general, like, the whole course was just kind of... It was very dull. Now, this is probably one of my more, like, nitpicky ones, but I think it still deserves to be mentioned because the way the John's death in the books, I feel, was just a wave of emotions, and it was just spectacularly written. Yeah, because I think you have more of the buildup in the books with all the negotiations that he's doing with the Wildling, and when he gets the letter from Ramsay Snow, and there's also a hint of doubt of what happened to Stannis in the books. In the show, we know that Stannis died. I think the pink letter in the show was good, too. Well, you don't know if it's from Mance or Stannis or right. Ramsay in the books. And In the show, we kind of knew how he was going to come back and that he was eventually going to fight Ramsay. In the books, it's all up in the air. Who knows what's going to happen? I mean, just the wave of emotions. He gets this twisted letter from, let's assume it's Ramsay, but it's really open-ended. The whole writing, it's fucking gut-wrenching. It's fucking disturbing. It, but it gets you, it gets John like, excited. It gets the reader excited. So John's ready to go south. He's finally going south to try to take Winterfell. And he gets some wildlings going. There's ruckus going on there's chaos at the wall right now no one knows what's going on and then out of nowhere he just gets stabbed to death it's smoked yeah the better it was so much better like his brothers were crying it wasn't like a coup like to you could tell it hurt his brothers to kill him it wasn't yeah you could see where they're coming from you know night's watch they've been fighting the wildlings for thousands of years this was a controversial decision but it's not more as hate filled right they're crying right. it's like we have to do it it's for the watch and then the final word has to be ghost. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. That Well, that's going to be uh, number four. We'll address that in number four. To me, I can understand why the show didn't make all the Starks wargs, because I think it would have been more confusing. And I think it makes Bran more unique. It gives him that specific 
magical power, but I can also understand why all the Starks should have been wargs, specifically for John. The way that John is going to return in the books is incredibly clever. The way that George has devised this, that he has this, this white direwolf, he names him Ghost, and people believe that he warged into Ghost, and that's how he's going to come back. That they're going to fix his body, and then he can warg back into John. Yeah, and I which think, is incredible. Yeah, it's mind blowing. It's, it's amazing, and I think like the best thing about it in the books too is that it's not no one. They're not all. You see Rob conflicting with himself. Rob has a very strong conviction. He has to remind himself that he's not a wolf. Like he that's, he says that I think a couple times, but no one knows like that's what he means. But he you could tell that he's been having these dreams and that he's been conflicted. Arya has the wolf dreams. She's the one that pulls out her mother from the river <laughs> through Nymeria, and I don't think she 100% knows what's going on either. But then you get the through the dreams you get the wolf pack and how there's Nymeria is leading this massive wolf pack through <laughs> Westeros, and it's very subtle. But with John like John figuring it out is awesome they're not as strong as brand but to have that connection and they still have the connection in the show but not to that extent you think if there was one character that they should have kept him a warg it would be john yeah just, just keep john a warg but he's he's kind of not he doesn't really know how to control it like you said this is another change that i can understand because i'm not the biggest lady stoneheart fan in the books because i think it does take away from the red wedding i think it makes it less impactful because she just returns. But George, I think George was trying to show how revenge can turn people into monsters. Well, it's a totally different character from Catelyn, so I don't think it takes away from it that much because it's not Catelyn. It's Lady Stoneheart. There's just so much mystery surrounding that, like how much of Catelyn's left? What is she going to do when she sees her children and they see her like this and she's just as, on his murderous rampage to kill anyone that had anything to do with the Red Wedding? There's a lot of theories, too, that she's working with a couple of people in the North, maybe Howland Reed, to sit John on the throne because Catelyn was one of the people that was witness to Rob's will that made John the heir to Winterfell. It also would have been really cool visually just to see a fucking crazy zombie just beasting on everybody in the show. The reveal would have been amazing for people who didn't know it was coming. Right. I'd rather have that fall on Lady Stoneheart as just uh, having that fall on her than giving it to Arya or Sansa having to take up that moniker because... It's, a, it's never going to be the same. It's not going to be the same, but also, like, I don't, you don't want to put that on Arya or Sansa either, just to become vicious, ruthless. You'd rather have it, all right, give it to Catelyn, and then let Arya and Sansa, they still can be vengeful and seek revenge, but not to the extent that Lady Stoneheart does. Yeah, because she's a nut. And it ends with such a great uh, cliffhanger, too, with uh, Jamie and Brienne. I guess she was on the contract, but she did not have to be in the season. Well, I think it's, it's her arc suffered because they didn't include Lady Stoneheart. That The Lady Stoneheart cliffhanger at the end of Feast for Crows, where she gives Brienne a choice. You can go kill Jamie for me, or you can hang. She has to choose um, the person that I made this vow to or the person that I love. In season five, what does she do? She kind of sits around and looks at a candle, looks at a window. It's like... I think, I think the biggest part of the change is not having that payoff with uh, Lady Stoneheart. Because really in the book, she doesn't do much either. She's looking around for a girl of three and ten in auburn hair, right? Yeah. <laughs> with Podrick. She's Fair really face. She's really not doing much. But the payoff with the Lady, Lady Stoneheart stuff, that sets up something even better in which a show will never see. They just decided to, I guess, fast forward Brienne's arc past the Lady Stoneheart or just a completely different storyline. And in season five, I mean, you couldn't think of anything for her to do than to rather sit by a light all season and then miraculously find Stannis in the middle of a battle and kill him. La I think it was just lazy. She's not the only character to suffer in season five. I, I just don't know what D&D &D were thinking with this. I mean, it kind of dumbs down Littlefinger. It puts Sansa in a situation where she spent all these seasons being tormented by Joffrey. They finally get her away with that. She's finally being built up. She's understanding the game. She's becoming confident. She looks like a completely new character when she dyes her hair black. And then they go and marry her to Ramsay Bolton. You can't even talk about what happened to her in that season because it's so disturbing and controversial. I, I just, I don't, I don't understand it. It's, uh, I remember I said Dorn was, I think this is the worst change. Probably, the, yeah. It's, it's, it makes no sense. It really doesn't because I understand like you're trying to build Ramsay up as evil, but you don't have to do that. You know he's evil already from what we've seen with Theon. We've seen enough. And this doesn't make him seem more evil. This was just. But the arc stance has been out on, of place. Like, like you said with Joffrey, like how she's been all through this before, and you finally see her overcoming it in her own with uh, Littlefinger in the veil, and then you just bring her right back down again. It dumbs down the Littlefinger character because in the books, he set up Sansa perfectly to be in a position to take back Winterfell with, with him supporting her. But in the show, she just completely doesn't trust him anymore because of this miscalculation. In the show, it's kind of like it's over for him. I mean, instead of like finding for something for Sansa to do to help build, like she's already 
came back in such a strong way. And you already seen the start of her learning, starting to play play the game a little. And instead of adding onto that, where you can actually Littlefinger can basically create a monster in Sansa, where she's playing the game now, she's this new player, and she eventually will Littlefinger to Littlefinger. Like right. I think that's something that'll be set up in the books. You basically just tear her down again. And I mean, even though she did come back strong, now she's like helped lead the Starks and helped the battle and all that. But you could have done that in a much better way. She could have done the exa- exact same thing and became a real leader by learning from Littlefinger in the Vale. And another one of my favorite characters in the books and the show, he was, but more so in the books, is Barriss and Selmy. And the way they just kind of the best swordsman of all time. He's so great. Oh wait, he gets killed by a bunch of rich guys. Just mowed down. Kicked him to the curb, like for for no reason whatsoever. The actor who played Barrison begged them to keep him, and in the books, he's still alive and well. He's, he's leading. Hand, he's hand of the queen. He's yeah. fucking leading the army. He's. And they could have kept him and Tyrion. They didn't have to replace his arc for Tyrion. It made no sense. Just keep them both. I mean, he's such like it's just so sad. Like, <laughs> like he he's finally when he says like I want to lead a uh, a ruler that's worth my like. Who's worth serving? Yeah, a ruler that I finally believe in. Yes, and uh, yeah, I, uh, and h- the conversations between him and Daenerys when he tells her about Rhaegar, all the stories, yeah. all the moments that they share, great chemistry together. He was like the father that she never had. At least let him s- see Daenerys have success. You know, like way too soon. He's a great advisor. It was such a shock kill. It was just for shock value. Like, oh look, another main character died. You have Tyrion, Barriss, and, 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 oh, and Daenerys, and that would have been a squad. A squad. Even if like they change it to him dying in the pits, because then he's there defending Daenerys. He's not just patrolling and having some guys run up on him and stab him in the alley where he dies like a nobody. Yeah. At but, least go let him go out with some dignity, like a hero. Give him a saving noble death. Daenerys. Exactly. And in the books, he still might die. Yeah. And but it's it, I mean, it's going to be handled much better than it was in the show. It was literally like they threw him in a back alley. I mean, we're we're more invested. We had the point of views with him, like. He's more of a main character by the time uh, Dance with Dragons comes along. He's just generally a good character. Yeah, he's. All, I love Barristan, and I'll never forgive him. I hate the show. I mean, in most cases, when the changes happen, you get a little bit either a combining of characters or they kind of keep some basic points of a storyline. This one, they just absolutely cut out completely, and that's Young Griff. Well, to get a little backstory on Young Griff, apparently Young Griff is Aegon Targaryen, Rhaegar's son. During the sack of King's Landing, Varys saved him, and they shipped him off into exile. They put him under the protection of John Connington, which was Rhaegar's best friend, and they're kind of building him up to return to the Seven Kingdoms to take back the Iron Throne for his family. But then, in turn, there's another theory. There's a theory that he's not Aegon, that he's actually a Blackfire. The exclusion of Young Griff, it takes away from the Varys character, because it kind of makes Varys' motivations unclear. They contradict themselves. Yeah, I would say that's the biggest point. Like, I, I'm okay with the Young Griff storyline in the books. I know some people don't love it, some people do. You're exactly right, it adds to Varys. If it does turn out that he's had this plan all along, and he actually making sure that he would actually be a good king had the close eye on him, surrounded him with people that he knew would raise him right. He was essentially the pet project of Varys and Illyrio. Yeah, so it makes more sense for him to invest the whole country on him rather than Viserys or Daenerys. Because in the show, Varys is kind of like, oh, peace, I just want peace, but I'm going to destroy everything. <laughs> if, if he has a personal motivation, if he's connected to Aegon, if Varys is in fact a Blackfire himself, then it makes more sense that he would have these motivations. In the show, excluding this, it kind of weakens the character of Varys. Another thing, too, is I guess we talked to my, talk all day about how much Dorne sucked, but it also, in Dorne, this is part of their plan as well. They adjust when they send Ariane to meet this Targaryen. Is he a pretender or is he not? And it just. It just I think we can both assume he's a Blackfire. I, at first, I'm, I was very reluctant, very reluctant to like. Oh, God, think you hated that. it. But now I, I like it even more because if Varys is Blackfire, too, it makes it more personal for him. So let's, let's bring it down. Illyrio, this is, we think this is Illyrio's son. That Illyrio married the last survivor of the Blackfire line. The Blackfires are descendants of the Targaryens. There's just so much great history with the Blackfire rebellions. I can understand why they excluded it because it's a lot. It's it, even people who read the books say this came out of nowhere. In a perfect world, like they could have expanded the show. They've done the best with what they could actually, what was feasible to do. I think the show overall has done a good job of adapting the books. It, it, when you write a book, there's no budget, there's no there's no production costs. You can do anything that you that comes into your head. And a lot of great ideas come into George's head. They just can't put them all on film. I love the show for what it is. I like the books a little bit more. 